Thank you very much. So why is heart failure important? Firstly, it is a leading cause of hospitalisation for medical problems. In the United Kingdom, it accounts for around 2% of the total healthcare budget utilised to manage heart failure. And if we think we have challenges today in see overseeing the management of heart failure, it's a massively increasing prevalence. And in the United Kingdom, we're anticipating a 50% increase in admissions to hospital over the next 25 years. And that's as a consequence of an ageing population and also the improved survival for patients with ischemic heart disease, which is the commonest etiology. Within heart failure, we've seen a major improvement in the survival for patients over the last 20 to 30 years. First with the seminal trials of ACE inhibitors for consensus, then the addition of beta blockers from Cibis, Copernicus, Merit HF, and subsequently RALS and emphasis for aldosterone blockers. So three different drug classes antagonizing the activated neurohormonal system. And it looks very impressive when you see these data, and certainly in clinical trials, which is important, we now see annual mortality rates for heart failure in order of 6 to 8%. So dramatic improvements. And yet there are still major challenges for us. These are data from the National Heart Failure Audit. So in England and Wales, in acute secondary care hospitals, we are obliged to submit data to a national data set. 150 acute hospitals, and we get data from almost all of those. And so in 2012 to 13, just under 45,000 patients' data input into here. And I thought it would be useful to share the demographics of the patients that we're looking after. We have a markedly aging population, and we see this is the admission according to sex at different age groups, and we see that actually two-thirds of patients admitted to hospital in the United Kingdom with heart failure are over the age of 75. And for males, they tend to present around five years earlier than females. We are still uh, only seeing a, a, a proportion of these patients by specialists with an interest in cardiology or heart failure in particular. And we see here just under, uh, oh, sorry, just over 50% of patients during an admission seen by a cardiologist. We'll hear more in talks during the morning about the makeup of a multidisciplinary team approach to heart failure with specialist nurses. But what we do see here is the marked length of stay that incurs huge costs to our healthcare service. So a mean length of stay of 12 days for admission with heart failure. And if we look at drugs that are directed towards improving the survival for patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, what we tend to call disease-modifying drugs, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, MRA, which is mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, we see that we could do better in the getting patients appropriately onto these drugs and certainly looking at trying to get all three drugs on board. We see here that this is the minority of patients, less than 50% in a younger age group and only around a third in the more prevalent older age group. And that's portrayed in the graph on the right. We see a large drop-off in the utilization of these disease-modifying drugs in elderly patients. Across the board for these patients, around 11% die during the hospital admission. And if they survive to discharge, high early mortality rates. So actually we've done a large amount over the last three decades. We have a long way to go to improving the outlook for patients uh, to the levels we would aspire to. So I'm now going to focus on three uh, drug areas outside of the conventional neurohormonal antagonists that we've seen explored and built on sequentially over the last two to three decades. One is heart rate modulation with a sinoatrial node blocking drug, Evabradin. Second is augmentation of a counter regulatory uh, neurohormonal system, the natriolate peptides.
Paradigm HF. And then I think an even more emerging situation with the uh, evaluation uh, of iron deficiency and potential treatment towards that. There are many studies that have shown that an elevated resting heart rate is associated with a poor outcome in heart failure. Um, increased mortality, increased hospitalization for heart failure, and increased uh, cardiovascular death. This is just plotting the change in heart rate from a number of seminal papers uh, evaluating drugs in heart failure against change in mortality. And there's a very tight relationship between the reduction in heart rate and improvement in survival. And there are many studies and papers that have uh, looked at this. These are data from the SHIFT study, which is the study that evaluated Evabradin. And this is in the placebo arm, so just over 3,000 patients. And here we've got heart rates in quintiles. So to get into this study, you needed to have a resting heart rate of over 70 beats per minute. And we can see a stepwise increase in the risk of the endpoint, which is a combination of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization as the heart rate goes up, with a particularly steep increase when the heart rate goes above 75 beats per minute. So heart rate, per se, is associated with bad outcomes in heart failure. And we can see at the bottom that the risk of the primary endpoint goes up by around 16% for a 5 beat per minute increase. So looking at SHIFT, which was now published several years ago, but the reason for presenting it as emerging drug therapy is that it's had limited access worldwide. It only has recently got FDA approval in the U.S. for use for example, and I still think there are challenges about where we see this fitting in in our contemporary medical practice. But to remind you, um, Evabradin uh, is a selective sinoatrial node inhibitor, and it decreases the spontaneous rate of depolarization on the sinoatrial node. It has very little effect on blood pressure, which for some patients is an appealing uh, attribute. And is, is very potent at reducing heart rate. What it does not do is have a, any benefit in patients with atrial fibrillation. So that removes a third of our patients uh, automatically. Conventional inclusion criteria, NYHA 2 to 4, heart failure, left ventricular systolic dysfunction, an ejection fraction less than 35%. And to get into this study, you needed to have a resting heart rate on optimal dose of beta blockers if tolerated uh, of above 70 beats per minute. And the primary composite endpoint was fairly standard for a heart failure study, uh, cardiovascular death and uh, hospitalization for worsening heart failure. These are the baseline characteristics of uh, patients uh, in the study. And I think it's worth just looking at this in a little bit more detail because there has been some criticism about this study as to whether if we just increased the dose of beta blockers, would we have got the same result, for example. I must say, I think the doses of beta blockers used in this study, when we look at real-life patients, is very impressive. 90% of the population on a beta blocker, over 50% were on above 50% of the target dose of beta blocker. So in the UK, bisoprolol is our commonest used beta blocker in heart failure, and that would be a target dose of 5 milligrams, and so over 50% were above that. For carvedilol, 25 milligrams twice a day, over 50% were receiving above 12.5 milligrams twice a day, and a quarter were on the target dose. 90% on an ACE or an ARB, and I think impressively, because this study was uh, undertaken before we had the data of emphasis to almost two-thirds of patients on an aldosterone blocker. Mean age of 60, so much lower than the mean age of patients we see in the United Kingdom, but very typical of a clinical trial of heart failure, a predominance of males and coronary artery disease of the etiology in around two-thirds, and around half were in New York Heart Association class uh, 2, and a mean heart rate of 80. And this is the primary endpoint. So 
Firstly, Evabradin was successful in lowering the heart rate. It, it did what it was supposed to do. At one year, the difference in, uh, in heart rate was almost 10 beats per minute. And there was an 18% significant reduction in cardiovascular death and heart hospitalization for heart failure, although when you break that down, it's primarily driven by hospitalization for heart failure. And if you look at uh, a number of other endpoints, it did not meet uh, all cause mortality uh, in improvement, but death from heart failure was reduced, hospitalization from any cause. So I think these are impressive data over and above beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, and MRA. Um, the license, uh, I'll go through this algorithm briefly, that the license in Europe came in at a heart rate above 75 beats per minute. I think this was a very interesting decision by the European Medicines Agency in that they went and looked at a post hoc cutoff and because above 75 beats per minute was associated with improved outcomes including all cause mortality, decided that it was appropriate to use that cut as opposed to the study definition. I think if a company was chopping and changing their data in this fashion, they would be hugely criticised for that. But the United Kingdom, our nice National Institute of Clinical Excellence, has approved it for a heart rate above 75 beats per minute in sinus rhythm. And it's important to say there's been subsequent publications showing an improvement in quality of life with reduction in heart rate. And I think importantly, when we think about the pathophysiological mechanisms, we like to see an improvement in cardiac function, beneficial reverse remodeling uh, with a reduction in heart rate. So this algorithm is taken from the European Society of Cardiology, uh, most recent uh, update uh, in guidelines. ACE or ARB, if not tolerated generally due to cough, add a beta blocker. If patients remain symptomatic, a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. And if they remain symptomatic with poor left ventricular function, and the heart rate's elevated in sinus rhythm, that's where uh, Evabradin would be considered. I must say, we use it relatively sparingly still in the United Kingdom. I've just been uh, chief investigator for a quality of life study in elderly patients, and it's taken us a much longer time to recruit. This is patients having it for a, clinically, uh, a clinical indication, and I think that gives us reassurance that we are using it appropriately. I still think that the key is it's after optimization for beta blockers. And again, we can come into the debate of what remains the role for digoxin in patients in sinus rhythm, particularly um, used in conjunction with beta blockers. And I still think there is a role for uh, digoxin in some, some patients. We're going to hear about right heart failure a bit later um, and, and perhaps some of the patients with particular hypotension, uh, we, we, we use digoxin. Coming on to the second thing I wanted to discuss uh, was uh, slightly uh, more recent data, hot off the press, if you like, Paradigm HF, published in the New England Journal at the end of 2014. And this is looking at the combination of an angiotensin blocker and neprilysin inhibitor. As I've already alluded to, the majority of treatments well, pharmacological treatments for heart failure have been antagonizing the activated sympathetic nervous system and renin angiotensin aldosterone system with the adverse effects that these systems have on hemodynamics with vasoconstriction, increased afterload, uh, increased preload, and also due to their adverse effects on uh, myocyte uh, hypertrophy, interstitial fibrosis in the heart, in the kidneys, in the vasculature, and we've had major benefits with the antagonization of those systems. We have a natural counter-regulatory opposing systems, vasodilatory natriuretic diuretic systems in the form of the natriuretic peptide family, which is atrial natriuretic peptide AMP, BMP, and C-type natriuretic peptide produced across the vasculature. Not only do they promote vasodilatation and natriuresis, they're also natural antagonists of the sympathetic nervous system and renin angiotensin system, and also uh, antagonize the pro-inflammatory adverse effects that contribute 
to heart failure progression. And neprilysin is a neutral endopeptidase inhibitor that uh, inhibits the breakdown of the natriated peptides and other vasoactive molecules, particularly adrenomedullin and bradykinin. And they have these beneficial, theoretical beneficial effects that I've alluded to. The drug used in this study, and I think this study is very important to, to appreciate that it's using a new drug versus the best drug that we've got available and very different as compared to the normal placebo control studies. So this is comparing this against enalapril, um, which has got the best data in heart failure behind it from consensus, solved, etc. But this drug looks at a combination of an ARB with valsartan with an inhibitor of neprilysin. Inclusion criteria, again, typical uh, NYHA 2 to 4. Initial ejection fraction was less than 40%. It was then reduced to 35% partway through the study. And a marker of higher risk, so in this case, uh, an elevated BMP or NT-BMP or hospitalization needed to be on an ACE inhibitor or ARB and ideally on a beta blocker. And there was a, a advice to go into an MRA if tolerated. Patients with poor renal function and EGFR less than 30 were excluded or a potassium uh, greater than 5.2. And there was a complex run-in period where if there was a significant change in deterioration in renal function, patients were subsequently excluded from randomization. And again, we see very similar characteristics to shift, age of 64, a, a lower proportion of women, and a ischemic uh, etiology in around two-thirds of individuals. And I think they are sick patients. They've got certainly elevated N-terminal BMP or BMP and good other drug therapy. And again, we see a very impressive uh, benefit of LCZ696, now called Entresto, in the last uh, two weeks. And um, we see this benefit over and above enalapril, so not versus placebo. I just want to re-emphasize that, a 20% reduction and I think what no one was anticipating was a 16% reduction in all-cause mortality, and many other secondary endpoints improved as well. If we look at the side effects and adverse effects, um, there was a greater uh, incidence of symptomatic hypotension, but it does not appear to be an expense of worsening renal function. In fact, a suggestion that there may be um, some degree, perhaps, of renal protection. And there wasn't an excess of angioedema. This is a, a problem, if, if one recalls, a drug called omipatrilat, now going back uh, around 15 years ago, which was the interest in neprilysin inhibitor in combination with an ACE inhibitor. There was an excess in uh, black North American individuals of angioneurotic edema and thought to be the augmented bradykinin from the combination of these molecules. So that's why the rationale for the ARB and the neprilysin inhibitor. And this slide really just shows the magnitude. So the magnitude of benefit of this combined drug over an ACE inhibitor is very similar to the magnitude of benefit of an ACE inhibitor over placebo. So it's almost a doubling of benefit. So very impressive data, I, 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 I believe. And the challenge, though, remains for us uh, as to how we should use this in clinical practice. So the FDA approved this last week. The European uh, Medicines uh, Agency is, is going through a rapid review process, and we're anticipating approval in autumn this year. And similarly, NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, uh, looking at the health economic data in the United Kingdom, um, is looking at this at the moment. And the question arises, it, should this be used for all patients with LVSD, ejection fractions less than 35 to 40%, or should we be selecting it to high-risk individuals? ACE inhibitors, all off patent, ARBs, virtually all off patent, versus a, a new drug. And I think part of this will come down to the costs in, in, in the United Kingdom. This study required patients to be tolerating an ACE or an ARB to start with, and the question is, should they already be on that before they're transferred across? That would be, I think, very confusing and challenging to implement in clinical practice for doctors as well as patients to suddenly get switched from a drug. There seems to be a potential concern for using it in patients with low blood pressure. We don't have those 
data to start with. So I think there's a very much wait and see approach here, and I think we've probably got to dip our toes in the water and see, and I suspect it will probably come in the United Kingdom in patients with higher risk features to start with and, and likely to then uh, be incorporated in uh, more globally. There is a study looking at this in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction that started recruiting this year, a study called Paragon. We uh, have got a second patient into that in Portsmouth, I'm proud to, proud to say, uh, in the last week. And that will be a, a very important study. So finally, uh, anemia and iron deficiency and heart failure. The last 10 years, we've had increasing appreciation that anemia is a very common problem in heart failure and associated with adverse outcomes. And uh, there's this meta-analysis published in Jack now seven years ago, looked at uh, almost 150 patients, the majority whose definition of anemia was that, according to the World uh, Health Organization, so a hemoglobin less than 13 in males, less than 12 in females. And using a study definition, almost two-fifths of patients had anemia. We also showed a, a number of years ago that hemoglobin was a powerful and independent predictor of exercise capacity in patients with LVSD. But I think we're now moving away from anemia per se and more interest in iron deficiency. We've had studies looking at erythropoietin stimulating agents um, with red HF showing that to be neutral in heart failure and some signals of concern from trying to elevate hemoglobin with erythropoietin agents in patients with chronic kidney disease. And I think iron deficiency is a, a, an opportunity for potential treatment. So the majority or many patients with anemia and without anemia with heart failure have iron deficiency, which can be overt iron deficiency or so-called functional iron deficiency, where there's an inability to use it, mobilize iron from the reticuloendothelial system. And the, the pathophysiology here is an upregulation in inflammatory cytokines, a belief that a peptide produced by the liver called hepcidin blocks the oral absorption of iron, but also blocks its mobilization from the reticuloendothelial system to the area where it's required. And this is beyond hemoglobin. It's not just about uh, anemia. It's not just about hemoglobin synthesis and oxygen delivery. Iron is crucial for oxidative phosphorylation an appropriate mitochondrial function. There's very elegant data from, uh, uh, this is from a Polish group, Jankowska and colleagues, uh, looking at iron deficiency. And here the definition of iron deficiency is a ferritin less than 100. Normal values, so in the UK, it's less than 30. So we're going to uh, uh, ferritins that are perhaps above the normal range, but we would anticipate it to be higher. So less than 100 or if it's 100 to 300, a transferrin saturation, which I believe is the better marker in a chronic inflammatory disease like heart failure of, of iron deficiency, less than 20%. And we see that if you look at anemic individuals, it's very common. Above 50% have iron deficiency. Even in non-anemic uh, individuals, up to a third have iron deficiency. And it's a powerful and independent predictor of all-cause mortality and cardiovascular events, including heart failure hospitalization. This was a study called FAIR HF, uh, published in the New England Journal now uh, six years ago, that uh, randomized patients with iron deficiency according to those criteria, ferritin less than 100, or if it was 100 to 300, a TSAT less than 20%, to intravenous iron versus placebo very, very challenging to deliver. Intravenous iron is grey-black, and you don't have a placebo grey-black infusion. So you have a patient with her arm going through a little curtain, and you have a blinded research team and an unblinded research team. And this is a huge, huge challenge to, to, to deliver financially as well as actually truly blinding it. Uh, and the patients had very frequent injections in this really proof-of-concept study, 26 weeks. Um, and it, it was published in the New England Journal, and it showed that soft endpoints, that patients felt better, PGA, New York Coast, NYHA functional class seemed to improve, six-minute walk test improved, and other validated questionnaires about quality of life improved. And interestingly, everything had improved by four weeks, which was a time point 
before which we saw a change in haemoglobin. Again, I think adding to the credibility that this is more than a change in haemoglobin. There was a subsequent study by the very much the same group of investigators called Confirm uh, HF that was published uh, last year in the European Heart Journal and presented at the ESC last September and not unsurprisingly called Confirm. It was a very similar design study to what we saw with Fair HF for a longer period, so this time going out to a, a year. And again, a real challenge to deliver. We were the leading UK recruiting site in Portsmouth with three patients. My, the research team that I work with were really against going into this due to the problems of having a blinded and unblinded uh, research team, and it proved to, to, to be that. But again, very similar outcomes with an improvement in the primary endpoint of a six-minute walk test over the study duration, reduced fatigue, and other improvements of quality of life. Importantly, whilst these studies weren't powered to look at hard cardiovascular endpoints, um, they suggest that there may be an, a benefit in heart failure hospitalization. So this is the most expensive part about healthcare care uh, of, of patients with heart failure. So I'm pleased to say we've taken this on board in the UK, and I'm the lead for a study with a nice acronym called Ironman, um, which we've worked hard on setting up, and this is intravenous iron in the treatment of heart failure with iron deficiency. We're looking at patients with a low TSAT, not uh, according to ferritins, and this is to look at uh, a hard endpoints funded by the British Heart Foundation, our charitable body, in conjunction with some pharma support. And I think we, we've gone for a far more pragmatic design in that uh, we, it, this is hugely expensive to try to deliver, as I've alluded to, in true double-blind fashion. And I think actually many patients know that it's not blinded because they have a peep through the, the curtains when their arms hang, hanging out there. Um, but we've got blinded endpoint adjudication with a primary endpoint of cardiovascular mortality and recurrent heart failure hospitalizations. And the the first secondary endpoint being all-cause mortality, which uh, blinding becomes less relevant towards. And we, we're having 1,300 patients, 50 UK centres. Uh, we're going through the ethical review process, but it's fully funded in the last few months and looking to recruit first patient in November. So in summary, I think it's iron deficiency and not necessarily anema that's important here. Uh, beware of a normal ferritin in patients with heart failure, with its inflammatory immune activation, and particularly in conjunction with CKD, which is extremely common. Um, the data we have in 2015 are that IVI may improve symptoms and quality of life, at least in the short term. We're hopefully going to see whether or not it improves true prognosis uh, with our study at Ironman. And a question that still arises, is there a role for oral iron? There's the palatability problems with oral iron, but whether it will get round the problems with upregulated hepcidin. So thank you very much.